My name is Jeremy Furster, J-E-R-E-M-Y, F-I-R-S-T-E-R. -E and at Cardano Foundation, I serve as the global head of enterprise partnerships. Okay, so let's start by talking about how Cardano is this ecosystem, like the rest of them, but there seems to be this camaraderie, there seems to be this ethic, there seems to be this kind of, uh, it's, it's the best world to everyone you talk to who talks about Cardano, they're like, it's the best of the best because of the support, the camaraderie, the network, just everything about it. Yeah, so Cardano is a you know, public permissionless blockchain uh, protocol, uh, which is also dependent on its ecosystem for use. You know, one of the things that distinguishes Cardano from, from other blockchains is that a lot of questions that were first asked is, how do we develop a blockchain that can be used to solve real world problems? And it, it's not based off of a, a system that everyone has to use natively. Rather, it's a system that will update you know, financial and social systems that already exist. And because of these type of value sets that's been thought about for you know, real world adoption, uh, part of this has led to a very strong community of people that really believe in the mission at hand, which is to you know, modernize the, the world and to transform you know, Web2 data into Web3 applications. Uh, in, a, in addition to that, it's a very decentralized blockchain. So part of this is understanding how a blockchain works. How is it that a, a transaction gets processed within the network? And we have over 3,000 different stakeful operators, which makes Cardano a leader in this industry in terms of network participation. Uh, in addition to that is actually part of the simplified processes that have been done to create an asset and, and transfer an asset that has brought in over 56,000 different you know, NFT collections themselves as part of that broad user group. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, Cardano is a proof of stake versus proof of work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I can elaborate sure. on yeah, so Cardano as a proof of stake blockchain, basically what that means is you know, what are the resources that are required to operate the network? Proof of work blockchains like Bitcoin, what they depend on are you know, energy consumption as like the miners that are, are used to determine who gets selected to produce a block. Uh, that's a great system because it's very secure, but Bitcoin itself is for a limited purpose. It's a peer-to-peer -peer cash based you know, network. When we're talking about digital assets and we're talking about digital identity, when we're talking about real world integration, what we need is an infrastructure stack that's able to scale. And to be scalable, you need to be very you know, efficient in terms of your, your resource consumption. And proof of stake blockchain, specifically Cardano, was been designed to be just as secure as proof of work in Bitcoin, but not to compete on energy consumption. So the actual competition itself is through a synthetic asset, which is the ADA cryptocurrency that determines the, uh, the ability for a, a block producer to be selected and confirm a transaction on the network. Yeah, so there is a, there's a, there's a separation here between the operators of a blockchain and, and the blockchain itself. So stake pull operators are the, the node operators. So there's a whole level of resilience and robustness in Cardano. So let's say that you know, one block producer were to stop working for some reason. You know, that would not take down the network. So having 3,000 stake pulls today is a high level of decentralization and reliance that Cardano as the blockchain uh, will continue to survive throughout the years. Okay, um, so maybe you want to address some controversial stuff, maybe not. Sure. So Ethereum just changed from proof of work to proof of stake. Do you have any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Or do you think they're, they're looking at what Cardano has done and following suit? 
Yeah, so proof of, proof of stake uh, on Ethereum has kind of validated in the industry about why proof of stake exists. Now, however, proof of stake is just the consensus mechanism for determining the, you know, the competition amongst block producers and what is the, the, the resource that's required to enable this selection. There are a lot more differences that needs to be thought about when looking at how Ethereum is implementing proof of stake and how Cardano is. Ethereum just started and they have a, a lot more steps to, to implement for it to be as you know, seamless and secure as Cardano. And that's actually some of the difficulties when discussing proof of stake is that there are these varieties, right? With proof of work, it's very simple. It's energy consumption and competing there to, to solve math equations. On proof of stake, there are topics such as, well, who is actually you know, holding the cryptocurrency to stake? So in Cardano, the, it's liquid democracy. So the, the funds never leave your wallets. There's actually an on-chain certificate that gets created that says, I choose to support this pool. On Ethereum, you have to move your funds from your wallet to someone else, and they manage that stake uh, process for you. And there's a lot of risks in that. There's a risk with centralization. There's risk for single points of failure. And you know, overall, it, uh, it doesn't really compare to the actual economic functioning of the, the Cardano blockchain and uh, how Ethereum is doing it. And that's kind of then you can see the differences between the ecosystems and the communities because of that big difference. Okay, so in, in the whole overall space, there isn't consistency. There isn't a set of rules that everything plays by. There isn't uniformity that's been set by a governing body. Would you say that Cardano is setting the pace for what we all know is going to be that? Because it can't continue without some uniformity from some sort of governing body that we can all believe in and trust. And so has Cardano kind of been, I mean, they took the whole smart contracts from Ergo and implemented it when they saw what Ergo was is Cardano kind of the front runner in, in I think one of the basic propositions that governments have is you know, generating insights and coming to a consensus. Uh, and, and normally, you know, the way that they operate is by looking at what are the existing you know, solutions being provided. Uh, what Cardano has done very differently is gone through a very rigorous peer-reviewed process to determine how are we going to construct the blockchain itself. Uh, there are many subsystems that need to be considered, such as you know, the actual core protocol layer, the network consensus, how a transaction gets added to the blockchain itself, uh, how do you participate in the operation of this infrastructure, how do you deploy applications, and, and et cetera. And in this area, we are definitely an industry leader in understanding this from a, not just, you know, Charles having a, a great idea as the founder of Cardano, Cardano, excuse me, but the ability well, to, not only okay, make that clear thank you. It's, it's not only the ideas of the founder, Charles Hoskinson, that makes Cardano great. It is that peer reviewed process by, by discussing this with experts in the field of cryptography, mathematics, and, and blockchain applications. And that's, we, we use this heavily in our conversations with, with different government entities about you know, proof of stake blockchain and you know, those differences with other ecosystems. So most people who first learn about NFTs, they think baseball cards. They think I'm gonna buy this for X amount, I'm gonna save it for this period of time, and then I'm gonna sell it for a great profit. But really, the, the benefits of Ethereum starting the whole trend towards uh, a product or a service tied to it versus Bitcoin where there isn't anything tied to it. And now Cardano has taken it to a whole nother level, it seems to me, from what I can tell. Uh, the technology is what's going to drive this towards what everybody says the mass adoption or towards the masses, if you will, being able to understand the benefits of NFTs versus that traditional baseball card mentality. Right, and you know, mass market adoption also means you know, mass market functionality. So in Cardano, there is a heavy focus on products, on features, 
and on the process that blockchain technology gets normalized in its use. And a big differentiator between NFTs on Cardano is that ability to demonstrate real economic utility and identity. So a, a perfect example, the only thing that people can see normally with an NFT of the baseball card is just the image itself. But well, how about you know, the, the trust that goes behind that baseball card? As a digital asset, you can definitely d know that this is a unique uh, baseball card, uh, but is it the authentic baseball card? Or is it a fake or a copy? So these type of verification systems and these problems that are needed to be solved for mass market usability are the definite things that we are looking at solving within the Cardano ecosystem. Okay, so every couple of years or every year in California, there's this, oh, the spinach is tainted and we gotta recall all this stuff, people are getting sick. Okay, so with Cardano and other blockchains, you can basically go from the farm, the pit, all the way through distribution and keep updating the chain to follow a product through its entire cycle and therefore be able to recall back if you need to because you can find at any point in time this batch very easily, very cleanly. Um, is, is that something that you think is going to kind of start to overtake traditional forms of supply chain? I think that when we're reaching into an, an age of disinformation or misinformation, uh, it's important that we have a, a way to program transparency. And that's definitely a value driver of the Cardano blockchain, is that we can easily map these real world functions into digital assets and digital records that you can use to connect to the physical good itself. So when you have to do a mass recall process, you're able to, to, to do that. More importantly, if you're looking to understand the actual supply chain process that was gone through to create this spinach, um, is it organic? Uh, is it not organic? Is it an import? You know, these, this information you want to have ready, readily available at your fingertips, and we're getting to a point to where just a sticker that's being applied by a government agency is, is not good enough. We, we need to be able to trust that that is the authentic sticker. So that back-end system, what is it? Uh, and it, the, the scalable system for that is public blockchain infrastructure. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm kind of a beginner on it, okay? But essentially, the smart contract is kind of a straightforward, you're verifying me, I'm verifying you, these are the terms of the contract, that's that. There isn't an if-then kind of aspect to it. If you do this, then this happens. If this were to happen, then this is what would happen. Do you think that smart contracts are going to become even smarter, if you will, for lack of a better word, or conditional in, in terms of being able to kind of deep, reach deeper into the legal world because it's not just a straightforward, this is the contract, we're verifying each other, these are the terms, and it's just kind of there. So that really comes down to how are you programming your smart contracts? And do you have a way for property testing? And Cardano is kind of built on Haskell, which is a very you know, deep functional programming language for all of these rules that you would like to be implemented. You know, that, that can be structured on Cardano. Uh, so one of the programming languages coming out soon is Marlowe, which is a smart contract language that is specific for financial products, where it is uh, restricted use but it's mapping these financial products. And you, you have this ability to simulate the smart contract so you can test before you launch what are the end-to-end -end operations which will occur within a blockchain ecosystem. You know, that level of you know, predictability is what is expected for these type of smart contracts. And essentially what, what will be occurring here is when smart contracts get more smarter, what you're looking for is higher assurance that these smart contracts will work as they are intended to. Okay, so um, uh, can I ask you um, God, you know, stuff? I thought you know something. Um, is there, I'll, 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 do, I'll do the end of the question. So at the end of every interview, hopefully I've asked you some good questions, but 
What would you ask your son? What do you know that I don't know or that other people don't know? The question that I always ask myself is, you know, why are people using blockchain? And, and the more that I'm able to answer that with, with different use cases on Cardano, you know, the, the, the better of a job I think that I'm doing to spread you know, the positive adoption of blockchain technology. Uh, it, it, you know, we're here at, the, at CNFTCon in Las Vegas where the major focus is on NFTs. And you know, from that, what most people are viewing is digital collectibles. Uh, I'm also presenting on enterprise adoption and supply chain applications that can be done with the same technology base. Uh, and whether it be for confirming the, the, uh, the originality of products, uh, you know, which is being sold for export markets, or whether it be tracing nature-based assets for climate impact, the, the opportunities the blockchain has are, are endless but yet the actual application itself needs to be done in a way that demonstrates value to end users and the use of these assets by third parties. So what I was not remembering at the time, I want to talk about decentralization. Mm -hmm. When you use that word, most people think of decentralizing from the federal government, from the banking system, from these types of things. Um, so there's a lot of different expansions into that. So you have artists and musicians who have been kind of using the NFT for a couple of years now. And, and they're kind of they're getting away from the record companies and the, the, the big media corporations, and they're able to go directly to the consumer that's interested in their product. And so the consumer is getting a better product, the mm -hmm. artist is getting better access and more money from it. Um, but you also have uh, it seems to be this shift from the creative space to you know a farmer in India who's got a small plot of land growing tea who can't compete with the big guys who suddenly now is going to have access to marketplaces because some tea shop in the middle of Minnesota only has three restaurants, can actually go to them directly. Mm -hmm. And you're taking the corporations and the control of the market, the traditional financial markets, futures, all that kind of thing. You're kind of putting it in business, almost like eBay did you know, back in the day. It kind of allowed small businesses to flourish. And, and you want to talk about any of that kind of decentralization or just go wherever you go? Basically, I throw a bunch of shit out and you run with it. So. Yeah, I mean, decentralization is great for uh, a number of, of benefits. You know, one of them is providing an ulterior you know, tech stack that people can use to create assets of value and, and sell them within a, a marketplace. But when we're looking at decentralization, we're also looking at how does this scale into mass markets? And we're looking at, and in this way, we have to start moving from a peer-to-peer -peer framework to a B2B framework. And looking at public permissionless infrastructure where compliant systems can sit on top of that. For example, if, if you do have a, a farmer in India and they, they do want to reach people outside of their local area, you know, digital assets is a great way to expand that growth. But how do you trust that digital asset? More and more, what will happen is that there will be involvement from government agencies that can be in involved in the process of the actual asset issuance itself and for to provide that layer of authenticity and, and verification that says, we can confirm that this is a real product from India. And these are the ingredients that were used. And so for yourself as a consumer, you want to support that small business to grow. But you have to be able to trust that it is a small business and that it is not someone from some other far corner of the earth that is selling you tea or snake oil. So just in very, very simplistic terms, for people who don't get into this, could you say that blockchain in general could be described like this? So you have different platforms, Android versus Apple, so to speak. Yeah. And the, the platform, Cardano, is, is either a tap, right? Mm -hmm. And so the app that you install on the phone, the blockchain itself, is on top of the phone. You, you see where I'm getting at is a lot of people can't wrap their head around the blockchain versus the platform. Right. And the relationship between the two. Is there any way you can put it in some analogy that's so simple that even the, even the least tech person in the world gets it? Sure. I mean, so... The blockchain is Apple, and the NFT is the app that you download. So it's all about the operating system. 
and how is that built? Uh, everyone uses Apple and Microsoft as two different operating systems due to their usability and you know, easy to integrate within their products. And so blockchains work in the same way as social and financial operating systems. The, it needs to be able to, to connect to your already existing you know, products and technical processes that you use in everyday life. 